Hi again, greetings from Sarasota, Dr. Yunus here. I was asked to discuss my experience with these techniques for management of inguinal hernia. These are my primary choices for inguinal hernia repair. Clearly I am doing much less open mesh repairs and much more robotic repairs and open non-mesh repairs. The choices that I'm making are influenced uh, not just by patient demand, by multiple factors, which is what we'll discuss in this talk, but clearly I am also significantly influenced by my frequent encounters with a large portion of my practice uh, being a post herniography inguinodynia practice from um, uh, other uh, previous uh, repairs, which are usually open mesh repairs of different types, as you all know. The, the choices that we have would benefit from some simple algorithm. In order to determine the best option for each patient, I would love to create some simple algorithm. I'm always looking for this in any talk that I see among certain experts uh, in uh, hernia repair. I don't think this task is, uh, is very simple because of the numerous pieces of data that we use to make these decisions, and it would be much simpler uh, as a surgeon if the um, decision tree was uh, that simple. So the algorithm that I'm always in search of, I don't think truly exists. You know, algorithms really are a mathematical problem, a computer issue, step-by-step -step approach. And despite the digital world that we are living in and the ultra high definition digital image that we constantly see in our beautiful robotic view, it is clear that we surgeons still analyze our patients' best interests or choice of operation in an analog fashion. The decision is not just based on digital data. Also, in, in trying to uh, map out what makes our decisions happen, please consider the possibility that someday maybe somebody like Google can extract the ACHQC data and create a simplified algorithm for patients to decide what operation they think they will need. And when that happens, you thought that your office consultations couldn't take any longer since the media mesh frenzy? Well, just wait till they get a hold of the uh, algorithmic data from our database. The um, the factors that we use to uh, choose the optimal uh, surgical technique are numerous, and some of these are uh, commonly discussed, and others are vague subconscious influences on our decisions, and that also is why there's no simple algorithm. So, of course, obesity has been our long-term enemy in uh, hernia surgery, uh, but what's also of significant interest, especially to me, is the distribution of fat, intra-abdominal pressure related to visceral fat, which can lead to loss of domain and can lead to uh, scenarios of uh, increased uh, abdominal pressure. And patients that might even have the same BMI that have significant extrafascial adiposity distribution of fat these problems are a different kind of problem, likely more related to wound healing complications. Um, also, when we evaluate patients, we, we see people that live, you know, do desk work or do nothing. And then we see these triathletes, which are a huge pressure for all of us um, as uh, patients. And those patients all demand different things. Then, of course, life expectancy, somebody who has 50 years ahead of them, or somebody who is 95 years old and needs palliation of significant symptoms where that's the goal and not the durability. And lastly is something that I came up with my small office um, called the PIA score, not to be confused with other things that are called PIA. And the PIA is a, a score that we use that we all can kind of be on the same page. Not every patient gets a PIA score, um, but um, patients that have some um, major issue that, are, that, that involves some psychiatric component, their level of intelligence and understanding, or uh, how angry uh, they are uh, from uh, previous uh, hernia failures uh, elsewhere. So 
this specifically is not a judgment of people, but it helps your office staff. Again, not everybody gets this score, but when somebody has significant issues, it's, it's helpful to put in this three digit code. So the first variable, the psych, what we call the psychiatric, the P is some degree of mental illness. And unfortunately, there is a, a huge increase in the incidence of mental illness that we all see in our practice. And um, we use like a one to consider to be some well-adapted normal individual and a 10 to be some patient who's potentially institutionalizable with severe psychosis. Intelligence, similar, you know, one being, you know, somebody who has limited um, uh, cognitive abilities and 10 being someone who approaches genius and anger. You know, this is not uncommon. We all see this. These are people that are not necessarily showing anger toward you at your first visit, but you can tell from the minute you walk in the room that there's this palpable anger of what they've already been through with previous failures or complications. And again, you know, one is they're totally pleasant and not angry at all, and 10 is a severe anger. So the easiest patient to deal with is somebody who, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be the exact, but it'll say a one five one, you know, so again, a psychiatric one, intelligence five, anger one, those patients are wonderful. And a very difficult person to deal with and where there's certain decisions you'll have to make based on this is a psychiatric 10, intelligence one, and anger 10. Think about that. So the another big part of the potential algorithm of the surgical choice variables um, and um, you know, open, laparoscopic, robotic, do we do it anterior, posterior, intra-abdominal, retroperitoneal, extraperitoneal? Do we use synthetic permanent mesh, absorbable mesh, biological mesh, or no mesh? All of these choices have their own uh, subtleties. And then a next, uh, another variable that is very important to consider because it'll, you know, it has a lot to do with patient satisfaction and long-term outcome is what the patient wants, what they're coming in with their own knowledge. I would say one out of five of my patients is coming in with a significant uh, component of significant internet level research on what they think they should have for an inguinal hernia repair. And probably one out of three already, you know, already at the last minute gonna be asking you about mesh and we all have the same experience. So these are the variables of what a patient wants. So the most common one is I don't want mesh, mesh is evil, and we're all learning to deal with that. We all have our ways to deal with that. Interestingly, you know, as much as I and most of you are loving robotic surgery and it's a huge advantage and in our understanding of um, uh, hernias and their anatomy, the patients are rarely, almost never asking for a robotic operation. And then almost never is a patient who's asking to use mesh, despite the most significant data we have in our world of hernia surgery of the use of mesh increasing durability, you know, more than 50% uh, uh, um, uh, higher than patients without mesh. No one is asking for mesh these days. So my personal algorithm or decision tree for management of inguinal hernia is clouded by many of these issues. It's clouded by the patient's uh, demands and requests. It's clouded by historical data. And I say historical data, meaning, you know, our, you know, uh, history of, um, of, of papers written in our journals, which are from previous times that where we didn't have options like better lighting even, or better communication or the internet. And um, and, and of course, uh, the robot. And then the third problem that really clouds my decision making is my tertiary hernia practice that many of you also share, where I see a lot of hernia recurrences, a lot of mesh complications, and a lot of unhappy people from chronic groin pain mm -hmm. or other problems. So these issues that patients are coming in with also uh, clouds my decision making. In a, a typical surgical day on a, you know, in a hospital day or an outpatient surgery day, you know, it's even more confusing because I'm, you know, putting mesh in four or five people. 
I'm removing it in one or two people, and then I'm doing a non-mesh repair in two or three people. It's pretty confusing about really what the right thing is. So when I look at any data that might help me, you know, there's a lot of, lot of papers uh, in the recent past about different surgical techniques for inguinal hernia. Um, but I really admire the efforts of the uh, hernia med um, database uh, from Dr. Kirkeling in uh, Berlin. And, um, you know, this particular paper, he's writing a lot of papers based on that database, which I find quite valuable. Um, you know, looks at about 2,000 people are involved in each group of Scholdeis, Lichtenstein, TEP, and TAP techniques, and he compares the Scholdeis to each of them. And I think what's important here is that you know, Scholdeis being a non-mesh technique, it's not like it showed some extraordinarily higher recurrence rate. It's pretty similar. Um, at the same time, though, it, it did reveal uh, less pain than an open mesh repair um, at one year. Um, but at the same time, you know, the patients that were operated with the Scholeis technique tended to be younger with uh, lower BMIs and smaller hernias and less risk factors. When I look at my own data, um, I'm a little disappointed in my own data because I have been um, quite lax at uh, working hard on getting accurate long-term data. And my data is skewed, as I mentioned previously, by the fact that we tend to enter complications or recurrences a lot more than me talking to people five years later with satisfaction after a simple shoulder ice repair. So on the first um, here, we can see um, the uh, volume that I've had over the last three and a half years in inguinal hernia repairs. And that doesn't include um, bilaterals, which is about another 150 cases, and also a lot of open mesh repairs, Lichtenstein and others that I uh, perform. Um, the, uh, I want to bring your attention to this highlighted uh, area on the bottom, my two-year inguinal hernia recurrence rate. You know, it says it's 5%, but that's only with 41 people where really I should have been speaking with and following up on 162. And believe me, I am very motivated to work harder on this data for um, my own benefit to uh, see what's, um, what my best choices are in the future. The, um, but to speak about what my little thinking is, what can I give you simply for open inguinal hernia repair without mesh, these tend to be younger, thin people, uh, muscular athletic individuals with small hernias. Uh, I am much happier at doing a non-mesh technique as they are much more body sensitive and, and whether they feel the mesh or not, they will think they feel the mesh. Um, also, um, People who think, who will think about a foreign body implant, when people say, I don't want a foreign body implanted in me, they shouldn't get mesh because they're going to feel mesh whether they feel it or not, and it's not worth um, uh, putting it in them. Again, the recurrence rate is not that much higher. I also use it with females with a clear exam of an indirect hernia and an absence of femoral hernia. I've been a strong proponent of the European Hernia Society's recommendation of a laparoscopic approach for inguinal uh, female hernias. However, I've altered things a little bit in terms of you know, how things have changed recently about mesh uh, concerns. So which non-mesh technique do I do? Well, the uh, shoulder ice uh, repair I choose for large indirect or large direct inguinal hernias, or, um, and the, the DeSarda repair I use less often, but I do use it for small indirect uh, inguinal hernias. So who do I do open inguinal hernia repairs with mesh, Lichtenstein, um, and other uh, techniques? Um, mostly older patients, patients that need to be done quickly, patients that I'm palliating a, a hernia on patients that are not very active, that are not going to be the typical candidates that are going to have any potential complaint of pain from their repair. So who do I do a laparoscopic total extraperitoneal hernia repair? Now, this has been, you know, my main raison d'etre for the last 15 years. I love this operation. I've been through several learning curves. You never stop learning about, you know, the anatomy and exposure and what you're looking at. But I'm doing less of them, maybe because I'm enjoying uh, trying different things. But this is who I do it on still. 
patients who are primarily concerned with long-term durability, I'm either doing a laparoscopic or robotic repair because it posterior place mesh to me makes the most sense. I'm also doing it on patients that have no mesh paranoia um, and they just want to get in and out, not a big discussion. It's pretty much typically a laparoscopic tech for unilateral hernia. Patients with a virgin abdomen, um, um, I usually choose laparoscopic TEP over a robotic TAP. Um, just the, the theoretical advantage of, um, of maintaining the virgin abdomen because of the extra peritoneal approach that I use. Um, patients that have a, a likelihood of a hostile abdomen that would require a posterior approach for various reasons, previous open inguinals, um, I think, you know, I would do them laparoscopic because this way, you know, that plane is often preserved despite potential for uh, hostile interperitoneal pathology. Um, and then uh, females not concerned with mesh placement, clearly a lap tap is excellent, especially because of the possibility of an occult or future femoral hernia. So who do am I choosing primarily a robotic transabdominal preperitoneal repair on? Um, well, number one, I'm enjoying them. But number two, people with bilateral inguinal hernias, you know, my, my neck hurts me a fair amount with uh, laparoscopic bilaterals, um, depending on, you know, whether I not have a second screen for my assistant. Um, and so uh, those I'm pretty much doing robotically. Uh, significant uh, obesity, um, I think, is easier to deal with robotically than laparoscopically. Uh, patients with a previous prostatectomy who I want to do a posterior approach for various reasons, I'll do them obviously robotic over laparoscopic. Patients who um, have a need for a, a previous posterior mesh excision from a previous plug or PHS or laparoscopic, and there's a recurrence or I'm doing a mesh excision, um, these patients clearly should be done robotically. And uh, patients that had a previous plug or PHS, the uh, potential for that plug to interfere with the peritoneum posteriorly makes a robotic approach uh, much easier and uh, enjoyable. So I like, in the end, I mean, I'd like to, I like to keep things simple in my choices. Uh, I really enjoy hernia surgery, as all of you do. Um, and this is an example of how I like to run my life. This is a drone shot coming from my house, which we're not seeing. It's straight above my house. And it shows the simple, you know, nine minute walk to the hospital where I do most of my surgery. And um, that's uh, what it is. But uh, either way, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you.